Buenas tardes a todos y a todas las asistentes. Le doy la más cordial bienvenida al seminario titulado Justicia y Contexto. Good afternoon. I would like to invite you to the seminar entitled Justice and Social Context. This is being carried out as part of the project of Social Justice in Latin America, sponsored by Global Affairs Canada and executed by JSCA. Today, we know that the justice system have specific increasing needs, and of course they depend on their specific context. As a result, we are holding this seminar in order to learn more about and discuss the various methodologies implemented by the judiciary to address the current judicial issues related to the social context. To this end, we will hear from Hugh Adset, the ambassador of Canada to the OAS, Benjamin Berger, a board member of the JSCA Board of Directors, and Jaime Arellano, Executive Director of JSCA. They will provide us with some welcoming remarks. Following that, we will uh, have a threefold structure for this seminar. First, we will hear from Leonel, Leonel Gonzalez, Director of Training at JSCA. He will provide a presentation in presentation titled Justice and Social Context. Then we will hear from Justice Adele Kent, who will provide us with the keynote speech entitled The Evolution of Justice in the Social Context in Canada. And then finally, we will have a round table entitled The Judiciary and Gender Perspective. The panel members will be Maria Teresa de Asis Maura, Marcela Siles, and Marisol Castañeda. I would like to remind you all to kindly make sure that you are ready to hear the Q&A period after each presentation. And also, this, these proceedings are being streamed through our YouTube channel. Let us begin with the welcoming remarks from Hugh Adset, the Ambassador of Canada to the OAS. Hugh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pablo. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you today. A few opening remarks, but uh, frankly, I mean, I think you'll be mostly interested in what is to come after my opening remarks. But nonetheless, I wanted to say a few words of welcome this, this afternoon as well. First, uh, Jaime Arellano, uh, thank you for organizing uh, the seminar today on justice and social context. It's also a pleasure to not only see Justice Adele Kent on screen, but also to know that uh, Ben Berger is with us this afternoon, even if we can't, uh, if we can't see him right now on screen as well. Jaime, you've put together something that's um, certainly interesting and very important uh, issue, which is the question of social justice. And I wanted to explain briefly uh, why we attach such importance to the work of the Justice Studies Center of the Americas. Since it was created 20 years ago, Canada's taken a, a leadership role in supporting the center and its work. That's because it makes a valuable contribution to progressive criminal and justice reform in the region uh, and in turn helps us all to build effective, reliable, impartial and accessible justice systems. That in turn supports other objectives, protection of human rights and the reinforcement of democracy, inclusive good governance and the rule of law in the Americas more generally. All, I think, priorities for all of us. You know better than I do some of the uh, contributors in the past, including uh, Mark Rosenberg, a Canadian jurist who served as president of the Board of Directors from 2011 to 2013, and George Thompson, uh, another Canadian who served as vice president until the end of 2020. And of course, as I mentioned, we're very happy that uh, Professor Berger is, is with us and on the Board of Directors for a three-year term. COVID-19 has been difficult. Uh, it's been difficult for us all, but the center has been quite innovative and creative in trying to ensure the implementation of its mandate by using various tools. This is a good example today, the use of a virtual platform. Um, but I'd also want to recognize the efforts that SEHA has made to integrate gender equality, um, important to, for us and, and important for the organization throughout its work, uh, recognizing that this will lead to more effective and sustainable results in the longer term. Uh, as I was saying, we're a proud contributor. Uh, Canada has been one of the most important financial contributors, uh, has a long standing relationship that goes uh, back a number of years uh, with a number of projects strengthening criminal and civil justice systems in the region that go back to at least 2004. 
One of these is uh, improving access to civil justice in Latin America. This uh, will have us contribute $7.3 million over six years to the center. And uh, just to give a sense of the scope of this project, um, in 2019 to 2020 alone, 2,200 judges, attorneys, and legal assistance providers uh, received training. So I think uh, uh, that gives you a sense of the scope of the activity that SEHA has been doing, and we're, we're, we're proud to be able to support that. Last week, of course, there was the ministers of justice uh, or other ministers or attorney generals of the Americas uh, that met. Uh, Ecuador was the host. Uh, it goes by the uh, Spanish acronym REMJA, or probably REMHA. Um, Canada's head of delegation, uh, the Deputy Minister of Justice and Attorney General, Nathalie Drouin, said in her statement that access to justice goes beyond access to courts, lawyers, and the formal justice system. Uh, and I think this is important. It encompasses access to the information, resources, and the formal and informal mechanisms that individuals need to prevent, to identify, and to resolve their legal problems. And from our perspective, we need better connected and, and, uh, and need to be more responsive to the individuals and communities that we serve. And a people-focused approach to justice will be critical for that. Um, as you know, unfortunately, racism and discrimination are still prevalent in some communities, including uh, racism and discrimination against Indigenous peoples, against LGBTQ2 spirited persons, um, women and people living with disabilities and, and others as well. Combating discrimination uh, based on these forms of social distinctions is one of the most urgent missions in the Americas in the coming years so that access to justice for all becomes meaningful. And it's something that Canada is uh, committed to. Maybe a couple of final comments um, on uh, ensuring that the justice system works for all. That means taking a people-centered approach to improving access to justice, but it also requires understanding how individuals and different groups of people experience the justice system as well. Um, in the uh, 2020 State of the Chris Criminal Justice System Annual Report, uh, in focus on women, that's the name of the report, Canada's Department of Justice provided an overview of the performance of Canada's criminal justice system from a gender-based perspective. And the report identified a number of things, including recognizing that women experience the criminal justice system differently than men, both as victims and as offenders. Uh, the report went on to highlight that efforts to improve the workings of the criminal justice system cannot take a one-size-fits-all approach. And, and just to repeat a theme I, I've mentioned already, it means looking at how the system is performing for different groups of people in order to better target programs, policies, and initiatives to meet those diverse needs. So today you will be discussing all of this. Uh, this discussion is another example of the importance of understanding the social context in which people live and in which judi judicial decisions are rendered and received. Um, I will tell you that I am looking forward very much uh, to this. I will have to step out at a certain point for a period of time, uh, but I'm going to step back in again uh, when, when I'm able to, because I think uh, the discussion will be quite important. I'm looking forward to hearing from Justice Adele Kent and, and also from the rest of the participants about the experience of other countries um, and uh, looking forward to a fruitful discussion on the judiciary and the gender perspective. So with that, thank you all so very much. I would like to first thank, uh, uh, begin by thanking Ambassador Adset for being with us today also our member of the JSCA Board of Directors, Benjamin Berger, is a member for Canada, Justice Adele Kent, also Chief Judicial Officer, Maria Teresa de Asis Moura, Marisol Castañeda, Federal Magistrate in Querétaro, and Lunel Gonzalez, our Director of Training, and all those of you who are with us this afternoon at this seminar. Eduardo J. Couture, a Uruguayan jurist with great influence in Latin America, reminded all lawyers the lawyer's commandments. That's what his work was called. 
And he said that the first commandment is to study. He said, first study. Law is constantly changing. And if you do not follow in its footsteps, you will be a little less of a lawyer every day. Then in the second commandment, no less important for culture, was to think. He said, think. Law is learned by studying, but it is practiced by thinking. And these commandments have even more weight applied to people called to decide in these cases submitted to justice. I believe that something that strongly impacts us trial lawyers enormously is that today in times of broad access, the text of the law in force is the scenario of a judge deciding according to repealed or partially modified law in the matter under debate or in another scenario with a frankly erroneous interpretation of the norm. But the judicial decision is, of course, much more complex than the mere knowledge of an updated normative text and its application from text textuality. Couture spoke of law with capital letter and mentioned that which justice must carry out. Therefore, studying and following the steps of transformation of the law is not limited to being up to date with the current regulations, although that is where one should begin. But it was important to be up to date with everything we must understand by fairness, that is, that which justice realizes through the law, the abstract, and that which it will realize in concrete cases through the justice system. We need to think or rather reflect on everything that influences my decision as a judge, everything that surrounds the facts and the people involved in the decision that which should be considered in this decision and the whole uh, scope of what will be impacted by the decision. So this look or reflection should be capable of understanding and comprehending the context and the field of justice and it extends beyond the persons called to judge in a process. And it's also demanded of all operators of the justice system and of all persons who support or assist justice in their functions. Today, in the following session, we are launching an effort to disseminate JSCA's publication with a constant, generous, and visible support of Global Affairs Canada. And it is justice in a social context. The idea is to extend Couture's mandates to the entire field of justice, of course, to the judges. But before that, in this temporal uh, continuum of access or denial of justice to police officers, legal aid, social workers, psychologists, mediators, prosecutors, criminal defense experts, and others who make up the channels or avenues of access to justice and who can also act as actual barriers or obstacles. Understanding the social context in which judges operate and make their decisions is part of this initial and ongoing training effort that since 2003, the National Judicial Institute and JI of Canada has been adopting for judges in that country. Justice Adele Kent Chief Justice Adele Kent, Chief Judicial Officer of the National Judicial Institute of Canada, will speak on the evolution of justice and the social context in Canada. The NGI has been another Canadian partner of JSCA, constantly uh, supporting and generously supporting JSCA with its technical knowledge, with whom we've been working for many years in a joint effort to innovate judicial training in the Americas. Based on the Canadian development of the concept, objectives, and methodology of education and training in justice and social context, we at JSCA have adapted it to the reality of Latin America and the Caribbean. Our director of training and promoter of this idea, Leonel Gonzalez, will speak to you in detail on this. Global Affairs Canada has such, had such an impact on JSCA that its request for a gender equity perspective in the project improving access to civil justice in Latin America which we carried out with its support, led us to rethink our institutional framework. After comprehensive and self-critical internal work in 2018, JSCA approved its gender equality policy, which has the ultimate goal of increasing gender equality in the region's justice system. To this end, we've adopted a dual strategy. 
on one hand, uh, cross-cutting or mainstreaming gender policy. This is an active and visible policy of incorporating the gender perspective in monitoring and evaluation of all programs and policies that the JCA develops as presented in the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. And at the same time, it includes specific policies for gender equality, including positive actions and just and aimed at correcting discrimination that is caused by the social system or as a result of social practices. The roundtable, the judiciary and gender perspective will conclude this activity and expresses our special concern for gender equality in the justice system and its access and decisions. Justice with social context requires, as we pointed out, that judges take charge of the communities they serve and they must know and understand the communities and people who make them up and who they serve. And they must learn to anticipate the impact that their decisions will have in these communities and in these people. And on the other hand, justice with a social context requires judges to take charge of themselves. That is to know and understand their own context, where they come from, what their ideas are, what their preconceptions are, and in order to honestly avoid prejudice and interpretations adapted to their positions. We propose this challenge in times of intense debate of ideas in the region so that judges may consider the social context of the environment of their practice and also that of their personal environment when deciding according to the law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jaime, for your words. And we would like to hear Benjamin Berger, the CA member. He unfortunately has low connectivity, so he sent us a video. Ambassador, Justice Kent participants. Hello, my name is Benjamin Berger. I'm a professor and the York Research Chair in Pluralism and Public Law at Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto. I've been teaching and researching in constitutional law, in criminal law, and in the law of evidence for almost 20 years. And it's also my great honor to be the Canadian member of the board of CEHA. And it's in that capacity that I'm very pleased to be able to offer some opening remarks today. Let me begin by apologizing that I'm appearing by recorded video today. My location and the technology available meant that this was the most reliable option but I am gonna be listening in during the rest of the session. And as you embark in that session, let me offer you perhaps a word or two from the Canadian experience that I hope will help to frame matters. There is something of a tendency, perhaps felt even by some of you, to imagine social context as a somehow separate or distinct domain of knowledge than the knowledge of legal rules, of legal principles, of legal history with which we as lawyers and judges are also very comfortable. And that is certainly the history of social context education in Canada, a long period of time in which it was thought that at best, social context awareness and education was an interesting addition to legal argument and judgment, but at worst that it compromised principles of impartiality and neutrality. With the benefit of experience, of exploration, of innovation, I think it fair to say that today, this understanding of social context is well and truly vanishing in the minds of academics, lawyers, and judges. Instead, let me advance the very basic idea as sharply and clearly as I can. All legal argument, all legal judgment is a matter of social context. I think that there are no exceptions to this idea, though the truth of it is clearer, perhaps in some legal domains than in others. And if this is true, there is no good legal education, no excellent legal argument, no fair and impartial judgment that can treat social context knowledge as a secondary matter, let alone as a threat to impartiality or to the integrity of law. To the contrary, as soon as one accepts that law is meaningful only in relation to the experiences of diverse populations, to the other forces and powers that influence the lives of individuals and communities, 
and only meaningful based on the real effect of legal rules and judgments on how people will then go and live in their worlds, in their lives. Well, with that understanding, social context, law, and justice all begin to fuse. That's certainly the understanding prevailing in Canada, and I think it's the core idea behind social context education and of this session in particular. This idea that context is essential to fair and just legal outcomes in areas ranging from civil damages to criminal punishment. And equality. To the extent that a legal system has a deep investment in equality in all that it does, that goal is simply unattainable if lawyers and judges are not well educated on questions of social context, including issues of poverty, of mental health, of legal history, of indigeneity, these kinds of areas. Let me share with you one way that this gets captured in Canada as you embark on this session. This is principle five of the ethical principles for judges issued by the Canadian Judicial Council. Note that in the name of equality, it requires judges to strive to be aware of differences arising from social context. And here you will see that in the commentary on this principle, the Judicial Council explains that judges should, quote, attempt by appropriate means to remain informed about changing attitudes and values and to take advantage of suitable e uh, educational opportunities, which ought to be made reasonably available, that will assist them to be and to appear to be impartial. The Judicial Council is saying that this knowledge of social context is essential to fair and impartial legal judgment. And let me leave you with a quotation from a judgment co-authored almost 24 years ago by Justice Ledoux Dubé and now former Chief Justice McLaughlin of our Supreme Court. Here, the judges emphasize that knowledge of context gathered from very many sources is essential to judging. It's about enlarging one's mind to judge and reason effectively. And they include, conclude with this very powerful statement. Quote, this process of enlargement is not only consistent with impartiality, it may also be seen as its essential precondition. This, it seems to me, is an insight that is important to the goals that we all share for justice in this region, and an insight that grounds this session today on social context, justice, and education. Thank you, and enjoy the session. Muchas gracias, Benjamín, por, por, por sus palabras. Eh, damos por concluida esta primera parte con las palabras inaugurales. Y... Thank you, Benjamin, for those welcoming remarks. We have hereby concluded this inaugural session. Let us continue with a presentation on the JSCA publication entitled Justice and Social Context. This is part of the project sponsored by Global Affairs Canada. The director of training of CEJA, Leonel González, will provide us with this presentation, the director of training at JSCA. Good afternoon. Thank you to all of you. Greetings. It's truly a pleasure to be here today with you. I am pleased to see that we are joined by Ambassador Adset. Thank you for that. And Jaime as well. Thank you for joining us. And our board member and Professor Benjamin Berger, who just recently provided us with some context with regard to the situation in Canada relative to the upcoming presentations. Welcome, Justice Kent as well, the uh, Chief Judicial Officer of the NJI. We have a long-standing relationship with her, and she has constantly surprised us with her knowledge with regard to the social context. And once and then we will wrap up this afternoon with the roundtable discussion with Maria Teresa, Maricela, Marisol. They will refer to the situation in Bolivia, Brazil, and Mexico, specifically in terms of 
how we can include the gender perspective as one of the alternatives of this social context. I would like to present to you a book that we have been working on for several years. It's called Justice in the Social Context. This has been jointly edited with the Director of Studies, Marco Farino from JSCA. And here we address three key aspects. First, the general framework with regard to how judicial training has evolved over the years in Latin America. Secondly, and the, the core of this presentation, will be why is it necessary to conduct training in this social in with regard to social context and then the third aspect refers to the structure and the content of this book now with regard to the general framework we are our, our, our starting point was that training, judicial training in recent years has undergone a very intense process involving discussion and ongoing change in all of our countries throughout Latin America. For example, starting with the foundation of the judicial schools at the end of the 80s, and then during the 80s and 90s, primarily, we have observed a variety of different changes at the institutional level, and specifically with regard to the concepts underpinning judicial training. These have clearly marked certain moments of key discussions that are not necessarily linked to chronological stages, but rather that are linked to situations and emerging demands with regard to judicial training. Now, if we were to categorize these discussions and emerging demands, which once again, I repeat, are not specifically related to any point in time, but rather primarily they are related to the actual evolution of judicial training, we could point out three milestone moments. The first one is related to the more classic concept to judicial training, which is what we have called the encyclopedia-based teaching. This is similar to what Pablo Freire called the uh, banking education, the banking concept of education. Now, this uh, training perspective involves a professor lecturing uh, to these students, and this unilateral uh, training um, concept is also described as Pablo Freire as something that is primarily based on the fact that the students are merely passive participants that who store information and the actual professors are the only ones educating. And once again, the students are simply being educated and that they do not have any prior experience. Now that is what Freire called the banking concept of education. Now it was also termed the feed system of learning. And this was closely correlated with this concept of uh, theoretical lectures and keynote speeches. And we have seen over time that although they are a positive tool, their impact is quite limited when compared to other potential teaching strategies. Now that was broadly criticized it was considered to be a very limited concept, limited teaching style. And as a result, as I mentioned, it was broadly classic, uh, criticized and led to an entirely new movement, which is what we call learning by doing. This emerged in the 70s, uh, thanks to work by David Cole, John Dewey, and a whole group of Piaget, for example, and Paolo Freire once again, an entire movement of individuals that were, were referring to learning by doing. And that actually framed the next uh, periods and it was mentioned that students need to be at the heart of the learning experience teaching needs to be student centered and needs to actually lead to knowledge by way of experience in other words you will learn 
thanks to the previous experience of your peers. So that concept of learning by doing clearly refers to how learning is the result of experiences, acting, interacting, engaging. And that is one of the core features of judicial training over the last 20 years. That is what JSCA has actually focused on. That has been our seal, if you will, uh, in terms of the wealth of courses that we have uh, carried out. We have uh, significantly relied on role playing, for example, and simulating the various roles of the key stakeholders and players in a judicial context. And there was a turning point, that turning point when students became were at, placed at the center of the learning experience versus being outside of the learning experience. And that was all applied to this concept of social context. We, there was this one first milestone that was truly based on uh, disclosing information and lecturing. Then there was the student-centered experience. And now we're facing yet a new, well, a, another challenge, which is not new per se, uh, because this is something that we have been addressing for over 40 years. But nonetheless, it is crucial today, given how complex our societies have come today, have become today, we know that society is increasingly more litigious. The, there's more, there are more demands placed on the courts. Uh, clearly, there are several social movements and population groups who have made it clear that there are many uh, inequalities in our societies. Now, for this suite of reasons, we are now facing a new context, a context in which the users of the judicial systems are demanding that they, that this social context be a key portion of judicial training, judge training. Now let me refer to the social context as one of the key aspects that is now being included in judicial training. To do so, I would like to refer to a few key ideas that are actually teased out in this whole publication and allow us to define and shape this concept. When it actually occurs, why it occurs, and why it is necessary to train the judiciary in social context. And then I will refer to a few potential models for applying this. Allow me to show you this caricature. It says, our head thinks where our feet step. This is a loosely interpreted quote by the Brazilian philosopher Frei Beto. And then we have Mafalda, uh, which is one of the most well-known characters of an Argentinian cartoonist. Many of you are familiar with Mafalda. And she said, well, I would say that it's best not to touch the issue, right? That's her, those are her thoughts in her thought bubble. Now, generally speaking, because we tend to generalize a great deal, we see that this is what actually occurs in our judicial systems. That is, there are certain issues that we know are at the heart of the discussions and at the heart of the issues plaguing our societies, but still the judiciary has purposely decided not to uptake the initiative to address these aspects. There are some examples. Let me refer to the feminist movement that actually has uh, taken on greater impetus in all of our Latin American societies. And we know that in Canada, they have an internationally uh, well-known feminist policy as mentioned by the ambassador in his welcoming remarks. And this, the judicial branch should have this type of proactive policy, but it 
that do not always. And so that brings me back to these uh, two images on the screen, the philosopher's words that say, our head thinks where our feet step. That brings us to this fundamental aspect. And I think this is a key message that we're sending out there to uh, judges across the board. In my opinion, this is a, a resounding message that is, it is necessary to truly pick apart the vulnerabilities and the needs and challenges that our audience faces today. Having that perspective does not necessarily mean that the system of guarantees will become, uh, will be loosened or eased. Not at all. There are different uh, different uh, goals there. Now, tutelage does obviously impose a series of requirements with regard to protecting certain interests. So we cannot, or the tutelage or guardianship system, we cannot talk about a suite of guarantees without taking into consideration this concept of vulnerability. So what are some, now when, when we do that, when we include this social context aspect, several ideas collide and crises emerge. So let me refer to one of the characteristics of the Castilian model of uh, delving out justice. The magistrates were actually quite distant and removed from society. That was quite common. It is quite common in the, the monarch-based model, which is known for being absolute. And the judiciary uh, was often feared. And there was fear that uh, it would not necessarily be impartial. So this concept of um, social distancing is quite a concern. And I would like to link this to a second concept that actually is colliding here and is 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 on the verge of a crisis. And it's this concept of impartiality understood as neutrality. In other words, the judges merely imp Employ, merely apply law based on facts and and proof. Some say that when making a decision, the judges uh, only do it taking the law into account without having a set of previous values on the case. And we shouldn't ignore, and this is the idea that we present, is that this pretended neutrality is not void of content or stereotypes. On the contrary, this neutrality is the result of a system of values. And from this starting point, we and to think of possible solutions. So it would be an error to think or assume that the judiciary acts in a flat terrain and that judges don't have any set of commitments or beliefs before the decision-making. And when Lorenzo and um, as Lorenzo mentioned, we, we know that we cannot forget the judiciary. Latin America is the area in which JSCA works. It was not conceived in its origin in terms of human rights. It was more about a power that was going to resolve the problems of white men of a wealthy situation and with um, asset dispute. That is the original configuration of our judiciary. Therefore, today, conceiving that the judiciary does not have an influence in terms of beliefs or prejudice would be in terms of the principle of impartiality. It would be uh, 
limited, restricted vision about which I will refer to in a moment. So what is this social context? There's all those characteristics deriving from a social, cultural, economic, religious, or gender environment of people, which influence the perception of someone who uses a dispute resolution mechanism and that may generate consequences in terms of results, satisfaction, and trust in these mechanisms. Understanding that this is the context of social context, I would like to understand when this arises. That is to say, when does this concept of social context arise? And it's important to mention that it arises in Canada as a result of the Canadian Judicial Council in 1994 and in 1996 at the National Judicial Institute, which begins to implement an ambitious program in terms of training on social context, hence the importance of having its director here with us today to tell us about their experience of the NJI in Canada. Why is it important to train our judges in social context? Because there is the, co the concept of impartiality, the satisfaction it generates in the users of the system, and finally, because of the primary conflict. I will refer very briefly to each of these. When we speak of impartiality, as I mentioned earlier, it is frequent to perceive that those who judge feel that the greatest involvement in a community may generate an impact or may affect impartiality. So, as was mentioned by, and also by Sonia Lorenz, who is one of the authors of our book. She says that it's necessary to bear in mind that our judicial systems are homogeneous in social terms, in terms of gender. So this is a conditioning factor. It affects the uh, judicial independence concept of impartiality as a way to guarantee neutrality has begun to um, be modified with the principle of equality and the principle of non-discrimination. The fact uh, that it is recognized that there are stereotypes and uh, values for this principle of neutrality also understand that this principle of neutrality should be reconceived in terms of the need to favor more equal systems that can prevent discrimination. That's why it's important that when there is greater knowledge of the vulnerabilities and of the uh, surroundings of the users, it's necessary to eliminate prejudice and stereotypes as much as possible. We all know that stereotypes and prejudice are recourses used to complete the lack of information that we have. So we generalize and that is why we use certain stereotypes. We apply them to a set of people when we don't know in detail how this group acts. So the less the knowledge, the greater the level or the greater the use of stereotypes and prejudice. The second reason that makes it necessary to use this social context is to increase satisfaction of users of the judicial system. 
In psychology, this is a field that we're not used to working with in law, has studied this empirically and systematically and in different studies, or it's actually some of them that have taken place in at a regional level in more than one country, it has been seen that the evaluation of users about the quality in a decision-making process, no matter whether the decision or the ruling uh, is positive or favorable or not favorable for them, they still feel this need to, um, there is independence and that irrespective of whether the decision is favorable or not, people are sensitive to how they are treated and procedures are described as fair insofar as the uh, levels of empathy and of knowledge of the people's context increases. And when we talk about the primary conflict, we need to recognize that our criminal system has, in Latin America, has this primary conflict and we it seek to un, uh, repair the damage that has been done. And when not uh, when insufficient attention is play, paid to the parties in case of gender violence, when there is greater understanding of historical discrimination of women, the greater the awareness around this historical discrimination, the better the decision-making, the better uh, the conflict resolution will be, especially in the case of gender violence. I've always said that it's very different for a judge to know a context, about a context of vulnerability and of barriers and, and access to justice and and compared to those who don't know it and have certain stereotypes and have a certain prejudice towards how women act when they are threatened or lesionadas por eh, otra persona por el simple hecho de ser by someone simply for the fact that they are a woman woman de entender no solo el contexto de esa persona que When está we en... talk about this conflict and many times we look at the historical context of groups that have historically been have their rights infringed and in a knowing manner I would like to bring these es una de las autoras eh, these ideas by Swin who speaks about three practical application models for addressing the social context. On one hand, Swinton writes about autonomous learning, this traditional idea of giving judges materials and elements so that they can learn about social context. Now, this is a very limited system. There is a second approach to integration where they're involved in training so that they may get a broader perspective in gender perspective. And this is a reality in many uh, judicial systems in the region, and they are working on these experiences. We hope in the next round table to um, share the protocols for gender perspective. For example, Mexico has some interesting information. We use this a lot in our training or the efforts made by Maria Teresa in the Brazilian judicial system and also in Bolivia. They are spearheading efforts to have a gender policy. But of course, 
we are counting on many judicial systems in Latin America that have shyly started to include these policies, at least in the case of those who have done it, who have included gender policies to mark this that was mentioned earlier regarding what it means for a woman to have access to the justice system. Unlike what we men, white men of a certain social class uh, would experience. So these are the differences. You can even uh, speak of different access or a lower probability of obtaining an answer. Now, the third column that Swinton speaks of is immersion, a direct knowledge and experiential knowledge context. And this is what we've started to work on with the Judiciary Academy in Chile. The idea has been to design instances where the judges are participants of a process where they will be subject to deliberations by other groups. So there's training where they can share their experiences and access to justice, where in those jurisdictions that have a significant level of issues with respect to indigenous peoples, and the participants of the community will share their experiences. And we can continue to mention other cases, other conflicts, and for example, uh, people who are in prison, LGBTI groups. So we could identify many different vulnerable groups. For example, Maria Teresa will be mentioning Brasilia, but we could think about how each group shares their experiences. It's not only about offering a class or sharing knowledge. It is an actual immersion. It is a more horizontal approach. So these are groups, vulnerable groups that share their experience and share um, their take on those elements that could be modified in the legal system, the judiciary system, in order to offer a better answer to these people who go through the courthouses. There are many experiences, uh, such as this one described in the publication. For example, there are information programs that ha have taken place physically in the prison system so that the judiciary can actually better understand what it really means, what, what the individuals who are incarcerated actually go through and what it means to spend practically your entire life in that situation uh, also allows them to gain greater insight into uh, parole or probation, etc. This doesn't mean that the judge's decisions are automatically swayed. Rather, what we are referring to and appealing to is that there needs to be uh, greater ties and linkages between the incarcerated individuals and those who are responsible for providing solutions. Very well, then let me uh, conclude. I have reached my allotted time, but prior to doing that, I would like to refer to the publication we're launching. Now, this book uh, contains uh, sundry international experiences from various uh, judicial training schools around the globe, schools that have worked with methodologies that have allowed them to train their uh, constituents uh, in social context matters. For
for example, five countries have uh, shared their experiences, Canada, the United States, Argentina, the UK, and Israel. We are fully aware of the fact that there are are there's a plethora of other experiences out there for example in many uh, provinces in argentina in several states throughout mexico in mexico rather several states in brazil and in mexico and australia elsewhere we are fully aware of their existence um, and this is just a first stab at this and we worked on this publication prior to the pandemic and we originally planned on launching this book in person. And over the year and a half since the pandemic has uh, been occurring, we have actually learned a great deal of other projects out there, more ambitious projects or other uh, examples of uh, training experiences that uh, we can uh, share in the future uh, under specific projects spearheaded by JSCA. The book has a prologue that was provided by uh, the Honorable Justice Sheila Martin from Canada. And uh, she provides us with a wealth of interesting ideas. But one of these is that education, educating judges with regard to social context allows them to expand the horizons so they can better understand and interpret the societies in which they work. And this collection of articles, according to Sheila Martin, is actually a project that is worthwhile because it will also help us spark a discussion on such a vitally important issue. She also mentioned that well, I think it's very relevant and pertinent to wrap up my, my presentation with this quote, because yes, this is a vitally important issue. And that is my invitation to all of you. Let us continue discussing this concept. There is no absolute truth out there. And the experiences that we have uh, observed over the years as part of this project have truly uh, shed light on this and have, have made it abundantly clear that there is no single truth. And social context, as it is such a crucial issue, is something that we will continue to discuss openly moving forward. So thank you for listening and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, Lionel, for your presentation. We have a few questions from the public, from the audience for you. The first one is, how would you actually uh, implement the immersion model? Could you provide us with some specific concrete examples? Thank you for that question, Pablo. And thank you to Ana for her question. Now, one interesting example of an investment model not inversion model, investment model rather, that we started uh, preparing with the Chilean Judicial Academy was aimed at addressing one of their specific issues and it was related to boys, girls and adolescents and the specific situation that they address when they enter the judicial system, so the legal system. So we actually started designing a training course that was key. For example, this was meant to uh, be provided or to involve organizations that work with boys, girls, and adolescents who have entered the legal system or have had some type of contact with the legal system. And these organizations work closely with the judiciary to design the programs. They design a specific seminar, or I wouldn't necessarily call it a course, but it could be a meeting, a discussion where these individuals, these organizations share their experiences in keeping with a very structured and organized approach. They refer to the various areas in which they have uh, intervened in the legal system. They refer to how the hearings have been 
called uh, how the individuals have been cited to take part in the hearings, how the, the, the behavior and dialogue or the, the, rapporteur, the, the rapport of judges with boys, girls, and adolescents. Those are very horizontal experiences, actually. And as far as immersion is concerned, what we understand as immersion is allowing judges and other legal system officers to have direct contact with these individuals who actually are the users of the legal system and with no middleman, without any expert in between or moderating. That is to do away with the intermediary who would be explaining or describing what actually occurs and what ha and how these individuals have experienced the legal system. To do away with that layer. Thank you for that, Leonel. Thank you for your presentation on the publication. For your information, this publication and others are available on our website, specifically on our virtual library, in our virtual library. Let us continue with the uh, seminar. We will hear the keynote presentation uh, that will be provided by Justice Adele Kent. She is the chief Judicial Officer of the National Judicial Institute since 2014. So, uh, um, Madam Justice, the floor is yours. Gracias. Hola, compañeros. Estoy encantada de estar aquí con Dear ustedes. colleagues, I'm very pleased to be here es, with you today. Estudio español. I studied pero Spanish. No soy, no soy capaz de hablarlo con I fluidez. Espero do not speak que Spanish algún día fluently. Pueda Hopefully, someday I will be able to. In English. Therefore, I will continue in English. I am truly, uh, truly uh, grateful uh, for the invitation to be here with you today. I want to start by congratulating Seha and particularly Leonel Gonzalez, who I've worked with, as he said, on many, many projects um, for the launch of this very important work. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end of my presentation about something else that Lionel and I have been working on, uh, all heading towards uh, the International Organization of Judicial Trainers program in Ottawa in 2022, and I'm going to shameless, shamelessly promote it. So my apologies in, in advance. But let's talk about social context, and let me start. And of course, I'm just going to pull up now uh, my PowerPoint, which I will share with you. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to uh, tell you that, um, okay, are, am I, sh do we have the screen up? Oh, uh, just hang on, share screen. I'm not sure it's shared yet, it doesn't look like it is. So I'm gonna start that again. I hope. Uh, okay, so let's see how we do. All right, if somebody could let me know that you're seeing the screen. Okay, thank you, uh, Leonel. So now I will move it uh, and get, um, get the slideshow going. Okay, so I will warn you that there's a couple of times during this presentation that I will be asking for some input and I'll just say to the technicians, I hope that we are able to get a little input from uh, people watching. Uh, if it doesn't work during the presentation, we can certainly do that uh, at the end. So let me start by saying that there's so much about what has been written and what's in the publication that Seha has, has now um, uh, released that we can learn from about uh, social context. But as we all know, uh, things change. Uh, who knew 14 months ago that we'd be all doing this kind of meeting by uh, Zoom? Probably none of us had heard, heard about Zoom 14 months ago. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the framework that uh, Canada, the NJI, has established for social context education. Talk a bit about the the barriers to success, uh, certainly that we've had in our country, and then talk uh, about how we see things maybe moving forward into the future. Now I want to start with a little reflection and a story. So this uh, this gentleman here, all robed up as a judge, is a retired judge of the British Columbia Supreme Court. I unfortunately never had the uh, chance to meet him. Uh, he's retired now, as I say, uh, but I'm told by colleagues of mine uh, that he was a wonderful mentor, first when he was a prosecutor and then as a judge on the court. So about two weeks ago, Justice uh, Romilly uh, was walking uh, in a lovely park in downtown Vancouver. Uh, at the same time, uh, the police were looking for uh, a 40 year old uh, man with dark skin who had been bothering other tourists and other people who were in the park. So three or four policemen come across retired Justice Romilly and decide that this might be the man and they put him in handcuffs. So as you can see, Justice Romilly does not look like a 40 year old person. He was released reasonably soon within a few minutes when he explained who he was. Um, but I'm going to speak a bit at, at the end of this presentation about uh, one of the aspects of social context that um, is a, has been emerging in the last uh, few years in Canada. And the story I just told you is an example of um, the issues that remain that we all have to acknowledge and deal with. So let me very quickly go through the history of social context education with the NJI. Our institute was uh, created in 1988, and I've divided sort of how the, the social context education has evolved uh, into four categories. And I think it's fair to say we can do this many, many ways, um, but this might help sort of give you an idea of, um, of how it evolved. So the first uh, first phase for, was from 1994 and 19, to 1999. Leonel talked about the resolution of the Canadian Judicial Council uh, back in the mid 90s, and uh, uh, we haven't stopped since then. Uh, I was a very young, a junior judge at the time. I can tell you that Sheila Martin, Justice Sheila Martin, at the time was a professor of law, and she was one of my teachers for social context education. So we created a program of train the trainers um, uh, and started to imagine and roll out sessions in social context to courts across the country. So I, for example, was working on a program dealing with poverty. I know colleagues worked on programs on gender, on race, uh, on uh, cultural diversity and so on. So uh, we as uh, the trainers, judge trainers, uh, were um, taught how to build social context programs and then bring them back to our courts. The next phase of social context was when uh, we, um, the Canadian Judicial Council affirmed the commitment to social context education, affirmed that we needed to build more capacity and to develop uh, to develop faculty. And so we continued to work with faculty, judicial and non-judicial, and I'm going to speak a little bit more about that in a minute, um, through that period. The third phase uh, is the one that in some respects we're still doing, but I sort of cut it off at 2020 because I want to talk about what I see as a, a, an additional uh, component that has been developing. So in the third phase, it was important that we uh, integrate social context in all our programs. So you may be doing an insolvency program, but as we know, uh, gender uh, inequality towards women can have effect in financial contractual matters. So there is an equality aspect to even what we might think as a fairly neutral kind of legal subject 
insolvency. Uh, so our staff at NJI, when they were assisting the judges in developing the programs, were asked to ensure that in all of the teaching that we do, we think about the context and, and ensure that that context is addressed along with the law that they must learn and the skills that they must also acquire. Um, it, it, it is interesting sometimes because it can be sometimes on the surface a challenge to say, how could we possibly have um, a uh, social context component to uh, a commercial contract, um, uh, a, a family matter? Sometimes it's more obvious than others, um, but it's important that uh, it becomes a real part integration uh, into the broader um, uh, judicial education. And I think uh, you heard Professor Berger talk about that earlier today as well. So what is the context in Canada? I've identified uh, probably three or four of our most important issues at this time. Um, there are obviously more, but these are ones where we have paid particular attention. The first is the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission report with the calls to action. Now, this addresses the historical uh, uh, mistreatment, the colonization of the Indigenous people in Canada, and the very, very difficult consequences of that colonization and where we are today. Uh, the Commission developed uh, a number of, of calls to action that related specifically to the judicial and legal structure, uh, including the incorporation of Indigenous legal principles into, um, into the broader Canadian law, dealing with difficult issues like the over-incarceration of Indigenous men and women in our uh, prisons and so on. So that's one of the contexts that judges have to work in. A few years after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there was a, a, a subsequent commission uh, that um, dealt with murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls in Canada, and they too produced a report with many recommendations. Um, so this is another aspect of the mistreatment of Indigenous peoples through the, uh, through the uh, residential school system, uh, through some of the uh, unfortunate adoption practices that occurred in the 1960s and so on, and what the consequences have been, particularly for women and girls, Indigenous women and girls in Canada. Third, uh, if any of you have been to Canada, you know we are luckily a very diverse society. Uh, we have people uh, coming from all over the world. I can sit in a courtroom some days and look around and uh, see people from all different parts of the world speaking many different uh, languages, uh, practicing many different religions and so on. And for me to do my job, I need to understand the context of those people. Not only the context of where they came from, but the context of their time in Canada, because it will be different than my time in Canada as someone who was born and, and raised here. Then there's there are the what I call the disruptors, and I'm not. This isn't a pejorative term. This isn't bad. This is good. The disruption that happens in our society, and we, and I suspect you, have had um, disruptions of what we thought was the status quo, quo through the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, and so on. And those kinds of uh, actions uh, are the kinds of things that make us think carefully about. Uh, the context of the people that we as judges are serving and therefore what training we need to give um, our judges. Now, here's my first question. And as I say, we'll see how this works. Uh, and if it doesn't, we can do it at the end. But I'm wondering if uh, anybody wants to volunteer uh, any context like the ones that I've shared uh, for, with you from Canada that are perhaps different uh, in the regions and the countries that uh, that uh, you're in. Does anybody have anything they want to offer? And I don't know if Pablo is going to uh, be my technical help here. Un segundo, porque estamos esperando que, que alguien participe a través del chat en vivo. 
one second. We're seeing if anyone participates through the chat. If we don't have anyone now, we can move on. Uh, Pablo, do we have any participants now who want to offer anything? Aún no, aún no hay participantes. Continúa, por favor. No, not yet. All right, so let's move on. And uh, there may be something that comes to mind as we're going through the, um, uh, the presentation. So let me now talk about the principles of judicial education. And as I say, I'll give you a little hint. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this at the end and a project that Lee and Ellen and I are working on. So many years ago, NGI developed 20 pr principles of judicial education, which was intended to guide the Institute in how we develop education for Canadian judges. And I haven't listed them all here, uh, but the ones that I think are important to social context education. First of all, uh, judicial education must be judge led. Uh, so that's why we have as our board chair, the Chief Justice of Canada. There are judges on our board. I am the Chief Judicial Officer and I am a judge. And on our planning committees, we always have judges to ensure that the education is relevant and meaningful um, for judges. Just like uh, Lionel spoke to us earlier, uh, our education model is one that's moved on from the peer lecture and we apply adult education principles. And that is particularly important when you're doing social context education because it is not about just giving information, it's about sharing and reflecting together and pulling out ideas and challenging notions that people have. So the experiential model is particularly uh, valuable. As I said earlier, um, we always incorporate in our, well, we try, we're not perfect, but we try to incorporate legal skills, uh, judicial skills, and social context into all our programming. And so, for example, if we're teaching judges about good communication skills in the courtroom, it will often be dealing um, with cases involving uh, people from diverse cultures, because of course, how you communicate uh, with people who perhaps first language is not English or French uh, can sometimes be di different than if everybody's speaking the same language. I wanna underline this last point, and that is even though uh, judicial education is judge led, it's important that we also take advantage of the uh, prof legal professionals, um, uh, someone like Professor Berger, who's on the Seha board, is one of our wonderful and very valuable uh, academics who works with us on many programs. Um, and we value them and they are impor an important part of the training for judges. But also important is to uh, 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 call on members of the community. And I'll speak about that a bit more uh, in a minute, but it's important that uh, when you're talking about the context of very different um, kinds of, and issues that the communities are involved right from the beginning uh, to ensure that the education is relevant. So the 10 principles of social context education. After uh, we framed education generally in the context of the 20 pr principles, uh, because social context is such an important part of our training process, NGI developed 10 principles of social context education. And again, I'm not going to read or go through them all. Um, uh, but as with their 20 principles, absolutely must be judge led. Uh, that we must not only call on academics and the academy as I've spoken about before, but also community members. Um, and really, uh, this is such an important part of ensuring that the social context education is actually relevant and meaningful and actually addresses the context of people because I come from a particular community. I can't know the experience of a black person, an ind indigenous person, a person who's lived in poverty. Um, so uh, involving the community, um, is important. And in Canada, uh, that's even can be more challenging because 
of how big the country is. So when we do education in Western Canada that deals with uh, Indigenous issues, it will look quite different uh, than the same education uh, in Ontario or perhaps, perhaps in Atlantic Canada because the Indigenous experience is quite different there as well. And that's why uh, one of the principles is that it must be locally relevant. Um, more than anything, perhaps more than when we're developing uh, a session on straight law, uh, legal knowledge, or judicial skills, it, uh, it, it's important to have planners and faculty who themselves are skilled as educators and also in the particular uh, subject um, subject matter. So those are the 10 principles that we've developed and something if you haven't sort of created a framework for your social context education, you might want uh, to think about it in your uh, particular area. Okay, so what does social context uh, training and education look like? First of all, um, train, it's important to, to train the judges who are going to then go out and work with, with uh, judges across the country. Uh, as I say, it needs to be relevant to, uh, to, the, to, to the particular uh, area that, that you're working in. Um, it can be a couple of things in Canada. We have done some national programs. So uh, if we're doing a program on gender, it may be one that we call on judges from all across Canada, um, but it may well be um, that, uh, that, that we also have a regional aspect uh, to uh, the programming that we then take to specific, co specific courts. There's only so much you can do in a big country uh, to make sure it's relevant uh, to everybody. So national programs work well to uh, start to create and design programs, but then they need to be uh, regionalized uh, so they are relevant. I want to speak here uh, uh, about one that I think was particularly successful and I think may answer one of the uh, questions from a Canadian perspective that was asked of Lee and L, and that is our program on mental health. So for that program, we did not spend time in a classroom. We didn't spend time in a hotel ballroom. We went to community centers uh, and met with social workers, psychologists, people who actually have been um, challenged with mental health issues. Um, and it was, I, I can tell you, it was one of the most well-received uh, programs for judges because they realized how important it was to truly understand the context uh, of, of um, that part of our society that is coping with mental health issues. So um, uh, designing the program is very, very important to ensure that um, you get the maximum uh, meaning for the participants out of it. So I'm just checking the time. So there are barriers uh, to success, um, uh, to, to social context education that are perhaps uh, a little more challenging than when you're just passing on legal knowledge or even when you're teaching judges uh, skills. I can tell you when I was a, uh, a junior judge, there was resistance uh, from some uh, of the more, uh, let's say more senior judges. Uh, I think they were concerned about their impartiality, that they were being told things that outside of the courtroom that perhaps they should just be learning about in a case in a courtroom. Uh, so there was resistance. Um, I think to a large part that has disappeared because uh, judges understand the need to be able to, under to, 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 to appreciate the context of the people who come into uh, our courtrooms and who were expected uh, to, uh, to, uh, to serve. As I say, there's, there continues to be uh, some issue with respect to the concept of impartiality. Um, if I learn something about a particular culture, let's say, uh, outside of the courtroom, and then I come into my courtroom and I'm faced with a case involving people from that culture, am I impartial? Um, well, as, um, 
uh, as our Supreme Court has has made clear, and as Professor Berger alluded to uh, earlier when he uh, quoted from uh, Justices Leroux Dubé and McLaughlin, uh, true equality and true impartiality, I would suggest, both require an understanding of the context of the uh, of our citizens, of the people who come into our courtroom. But it is a continuing issue that judges ask um, when we do the, the teaching. And the third uh, thing that flows from this issue of impartiality is what are judges supposed to do with what they learn in their judicial training about uh, the context of, of people uh, uh, and and all of the issues that surround them. Um, it's an interesting question. It's a complex one. And uh, Professor Berger, uh, thankfully, is one of the people who teaches our judges. How is it that, what is it that you're doing when you learn social context education? And what do I do with it? Um, so it's a question that I think is a, is a very important one for judges to ask, um, but um, it is one that uh, is is is, is explainable uh, in a variety of um, manners, depending on the issues that arise. So um, I had inserted here another time to have a little question, and so Pablo, I don't know if anybody is going to take me up on this, but. I've identified some of the barriers to uh, social context education in Canada, and I'm wondering if anyone has had any experience uh, where they are in terms of working with judges, talking with judges uh, about uh, social, uh, uh, about the broader issue of understanding social context. We have two comments from Argentina Wonderful. with regard to social understanding social context. First of all, Claudia says that in the criminal area in Formosa, they actually consider using interpreters in the event that the individuals come from indigenous populations. And then also with regard to the indigenous peoples in Northern Argentina, their culture is different from the rest of the, rest of the community. It's important for the judges to understand their culture so that they can actually judge them in keeping with their own traditions and customs. These are comments from Argentina. Another one, in Chaco, the law states that when the accused comes from an indigenous group, there needs to be someone involved in the case on the, on the on the court in the court who comes from that same indigenous group. So now it's interesting to see what perhaps you could talk about how the courts are used in Canada to uh, refer to social context, but specifically in terms of immigration. In terms of immigration. Well, um, hmm. there, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure the sort of the focus of the question. Um, if, it, if it is in terms of uh, how we deal with the many uh, different uh, cu cultural groups that will be coming into our courtrooms. Is there are issues of interpretation. Our Supreme Court has made it quite clear that we uh, must um, ensure that um, uh, there is proper interpretation uh, for people who come into our courtrooms. Um, there are uh, issues, sometimes cultural issues, uh, that it's important for uh, judges to understand uh, as we balance what we under, uh, understand as fundamental issues of equality and so on and some cultural, um, diverse cultural practices otherwise and how we uh, address that within the framework of our uh, constitution and so on. So if the focus of the question was how do we deal with diversity in our courtrooms, um, that is exactly what we uh, uh, teach our judges. What is it that we can do to make it a more welcoming place on the one hand, and on the other hand, to make sure that if our fundamental values 
are ones that perhaps clash up with what uh, they have understood from their culture that we uh, explain and make them understand the values that are, that are important within the Canadian uh, context and may have to override uh, the um, uh, particular position that they're taking in a case. Pablo, any other comments? No, hay más comentarios hasta el momento, vale. No, not yet. Thank okay. you. Great, thank you. Okay, so where are we going uh, moving forward? Uh, as sure as uh, we like to think there's stability, there will always be more disruptors. Can I, can I anticipate what they might be? The only one I think that's on the horizon that um, we have to think about is the environment. Uh, I, I, it, 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 it's the kind of thing that's bubbling up in the popular media, in governments, in policies that are being determined. And so I, I anticipate that that will be a context, contextual issue. Uh, for example, in Canada, uh, as our norm, northern climates warm, uh, what will that do to uh, Indigenous communities that have uh, traditionally been able to uh, to, to uh, thrive in a colder climate and what happens uh, with global warming. So that's the only one I see on the horizon, but I'm sure that's not the only one that there will be. I think the, the, the only thing that's certain is there's very little certainty. There's two other uh, issues moving forward that I want to address uh, quickly. One is some particular cases in Canada uh, involving sexual uh, assault. Uh, and the other is the research that's been done on un unconscious bias. And that last one will hopefully bring us back to where I started today. So let's talk about uh, the sexual assault uh, cases. We have had in the past four or five years in Canada, a couple of cases uh, involving sexual assault where the judges have um, uh, not applied the law properly and have used some rather unfortunate myths and stereotypes about victims of uh, sexual assault. Uh, it became a matter of a public um, conversation. It was uh, in the newspapers. It, it got the attention of our government in terms of ensuring that judges have the kind of training they need to be respectful and hear cases in sexual assault um, lawfully uh, and within um, uh, our fundamental principles of equality. Uh, so uh, the government uh, thought that they uh, a way to do it would be to, in, uh, to introduce legislation uh, that would mandate the kind of education that judges would take. That is problematic because of judicial independence. I won't give you the whole history. It's been three or four years in the making. Fortunately, it was sorted out uh, so that now judges, when they're appointed to be judges, undertake to take uh, training uh, in how to properly manage sexual assault cases, not only the law, but address issues of missing stereotypes, um, systemic racism uh, and other social context issues. Um, they take that training through the National Judicial Institute uh, and has in fact been valuable, not only for the judges because we have developed more training for them in sexual assault cases, but be it, it renewed our commitment to work with community members when we're doing social context education. And it, when it's sexual assault cases that we're talking about, the community I'm talking about are institutes and uh, organizations that work with victims of sexual assault. Um, we have always, uh, throughout the history of sexual uh, social context education in Canada, uh, stressed the importance of working with community members. Um, but as I say, uh, it re renewed our commitment. I had valuable conversations with organizations from across Canada as we were planning the education for the judges. Uh, and so, as I say, uh, the, the cases that 
happened were unfortunate unfortunate cases, um, but for the NJI, some positive uh, reinforcement of our social context education came out of it. The second one um, uh, brings me to, oops, uh, no, just hang on. I've just, there may be a slide that I have. Ah, no, I'm good. Good. This is the slide. My my Spanish. It's my Spanish that's not good, not my slide. My slide's fine. Um, uh, you recall my story about um, uh, uh, the judge in Vancouver, uh, Justice, uh, the, the justice who was handcuffed, uh, likely only because he uh, he was a black man, uh, and um, the, that was the police. It wasn't a judge, um, but I think it makes it all aware of the fact that we all come to what we do with our biases. Uh, some of them are good. Some of them are, are not good. And unconscious biases about how we view people of a different race, of a different religious religion and so on, are ones that we all have. The research has told us it's all there. It's as a result of our upbringing, who we are. Um, but having an awareness of what those unconscious biases is important for judges. And so we have been teaching our judges about the issue of unconscious bias, not only making them aware that, yes, we all come to our job with those biases, but starting to recognize them so that they can, uh, they can check in with themselves. Are they making assumptions about the people who walk into their courtroom um, that uh, are not fair, uh, they're not, that are not consistent with um, the issues that they should be deciding? And so I'm starting to think about social context as not only looking outward, so not just as judges looking at other people and understanding their context. That is important, but also judges looking inward and understanding their biases, because that can be another barrier to ensuring that uh, people are uh, served uh, uh, properly by uh, in our courtrooms. Um, so as I started out saying at the beginning, um, uh, social context is not going to be a static, uh, static thing. It will evolve. Uh, you through Seha have been given a wonderful publication that talks about the theory, some history and so on. Um, but as I said, the only thing about uh, that is certain is uncertainty and change. And I find the fact that we are looking at social context, not only outwardly, but inwardly for judges, an exciting um, move forward in terms of our education. So with that, I am going to invite uh, questions and comments. And uh, I just thought I'd show you this is I'm in Calgary right now, which is in Western Canada. Uh, this was what Calgary looked like on January 1st when I went for my run. Um, it reminds me a bit about the couple of times I've been in Chile because in the background you can see Rocky Mountains, which are much like the view that you get from parts of Santiago. So uh, I'm just wondering if there's any questions or commentaries, uh, Pablo. Adel, sí. Hay una primera pregunta de parte de Eric López que señala si el conocimiento... There's a first question from Eric who says sometimes they crash with the need to use their personal um, knowledge to resolve some cases. I'm just, can you just repeat that? I missed the first couple of words. Just to the interpreter, please. Sí. Sí. Pregunta, si el conocimiento del contexto can social. the knowledge of social context of the judge clash with the prohibition that they have to use their personal knowledge? Well, 
that's an excellent question. And I don't know if uh, Professor Berger was able to stay with us, but I should probably just turn it over to him. He has a wonderful lecture that he gives to our, our judges on this very, uh, very, very, very um, point is how your personal knowledge uh, should be used in court proceedings. And the old notion was that somehow judges come into court with nothing in their head and that everything they were going to learn was going to be during the case and then make a decision. We know that's not true because we come in, as I say, with our own knowledge um, and social context education gives you gives us more knowledge and in some cases the correct information as opposed to bad information that we may have from, you know, uh, our past and so on. So we have this not this personal knowledge. Um, in Canada, there are evidentiary rules that allow us to do some things somehow. Um, there are ethical principles that require us to apply uh, fundamental values of equality when we uh, when we do our judging, and those kinds of principles uh, allow us to, um, to to ask the questions. So, in fact, in an adversarial system like we have, I know it may not be the case for some of you, um, if you hear submissions in, in court that you know go against some va important values and some important information, you can challenge the lawyers and then get the lawyers to help you work through it. So there, are, it, it's not easy, it's complex. And I think if you're, as you talk about co social context education, it's also important to talk about what does that mean for the judges in terms of how they apply it in the courts. And it's, it's, it's an important issue. Muchas gracias, Abel. Eh, tenemos un, un comentario también respecto a... Thank you, Adele. We have a comment also regarding your first question from Peru. I'm not sure if you've seen it. There's been some difficult situations in Peru. And actually, there the indigenous people's cosmovision is different from other parts of the world. It's just a comment. Mm -hmm. And another question regarding whether there are other justice system operators that are not the judges and that receive this training. They do. Uh, I'm not an expert in it. And I sometimes find out because people will phone me, people training uh, uh, immigration officers, police, uh, doctors, uh, because everyone who interacts with a diverse uh, community uh, needs to understand how to in interact correctly. And so the issues may be different. Uh, how a policeman understands his or her unconscious bias may result in different um, actions than a judge who understands it. But yes, they get the training. So uh, I, 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 in sexual assault cases, for example, there is a great deal of training in terms of how to assist victims. Uh, I know there's an emphasis on trauma-informed training uh, in, in addressing the challenges that victims of sexual assault have and so on. So it's not just the judges um, who are getting this kind of training. Perfecto. Muchas gracias, Abel. No, no tenemos más, más pero sí, por favor. Can Thank I just, you, Adele. I, I'm going to make a pitch. This is my shameless pitch, and Lee and Elle knows about this. So in 2022, in, starting on October 30th, the International Organization of Judicial Trainers uh, uh, will be in, in Ottawa. Uh, uh, if there are... Uh, Institute members, uh, members of institutes who are watching this, we invite you to come. The, um, the focus of the program will be judicial education in aid of vulner vulnerable people. Um, we have very graciously been 
uh, given uh, a little bit of um, grant money from our government government because we know it's an important issue for everyone in Canada. And Lee and Al and I are working on a project. I talked about uh, principles of judicial education. And we are trying to bring to life the IOJT principles of judicial ed education uh, at the conference. And uh, again, uh, some of you will likely be uh, receiving an email survey from the NL and I in a couple of weeks. Don't blame me, NL, if it seems late. Blame me. Blame me. It's been, <laughs> it's been on my desk. Um, but we certainly would like to welcome you in Ottawa. Uh, in Oct October of 2022. And um, our website doesn't have a lot right now. One of my jobs in the next couple of months is to make sure that changes. So keep watching our website. So thank you very much for your time. I've, I've enjoyed it. Muchas gracias, Adel, por, por su presentación. Thank you, Adele, for your presentation. Thank you. This concludes this part of the seminar. We would now like to continue with the last part of today's session, which would be a roundtable discussion, the judiciary and the gender perspective. We will have three great presenters. Uh, each one will have 25 minutes maximum, and each presentation will be around the following question. According to your work experience, how do you include the gender perspective in the judiciary in your country? What would you take with you and what would you criticize? The first presentation will be by Maria Teresa de Asis Moura, who is a judge from Brazil since 2006. You have the floor. Thank you, Pablo. I, would like to greet Leonel Gonzalez. Thank you for your invitation, for the book, and for everything that you do at JSCA. I'd like to congratulate Professor Adele and all my colleagues at the round table. I studied Spanish as well, but I don't feel comfortable speaking in Spanish. And in Brazil, we have another language when we speak to people who speak Spanish, which is Portuñol. So as Leonel said, he said I could speak Portuguese. So I will speak in Portuguese, in fact. I would like to share my file so that you can better understand me. And that one is in Spanish. Thank you. Uh, no uh, no. Can you see? Ah, now yes. Solo que yo no los veo. Pueden, uh, pueden acompañarme. Está todo bien. Está, sí. Se ve bien. Por... Ah, sí. Gracias. Eh, yo pienso aquí. Bo, bo, voy a hablar en portugués. Eh, the speaker will now speak in Portuguese, and it is not one of the languages of the conference. We apologize in advance. Nesta nossa trajetória, brevemente trazendo, nós temos o Código Penal, que é de 1940, que trazia o termo mulher honesta, em se tratando de crimes sexuais, com ideias, obviamente, concebidas de moral, eh, nos idos do, da década de 40, mas isto foi sendo superado, principalmente com a Constituição Federal de 1988, 
que trouxe uh, o princípio da dignidade da pessoa humana e depois acabou, como veremos, sendo excluído do nosso sistema jurídico a partir de uma reforma legislativa de 2009. Outro ponto eh, importante de legislação, eu trago a Convenção de Belém do Pará, eh, ou a Convenção Interamericana para Prevenir, Punir e Erradicar a Violência contra a Mulher, que foi adotada eh, pelo Brasil a partir de 1996, e, obviamente, com a ideia de poder modificar os padrões sociais e culturais de conduta de homens e mulheres para combater os preconceitos e, com isso, evitar a violência contra a mulher. Mas foi somente em 2006 que veio o primeiro diploma brasileiro responsável pela criação de mecanismos destinados ao combate da violência doméstica e familiar contra a mulher, na forma do que a nossa Constituição prevê e também instrumentos internacionais assinados pelo Brasil. Esta lei foi chamada por nós como Lei Maria da Penha. E creio que é importante uma breve compreensão do caso Maria da Penha para entender a importância desta lei no contexto brasileiro. Maria da Penha era uma farmacêutica, foi protagonista de um episódio que se converteu no símbolo da luta contra a violência doméstica. Ela foi alvejada pelas costas enquanto dormia numa tentativa de feminicídio pelo seu então marido. Depois de quatro meses de tratamento médico e cirurgias, voltou para casa, continuou com o marido e que durante mais duas semanas a torturou é, tentando eletrocutá-la durante o banho. Ela teve uma longa trajetória em busca de justiça de quase 20 anos, que culminou, então, com uma petição à, à Comissão Interamericana de Direitos Humanos, da Organização dos Estados Americanos, e cujas recomendações resultaram, então, na Lei 11.340, de 2006. Na evolução legislativa, nós tivemos, em 2009, uma importante alteração, foi quando, formalmente, se eliminou da nossa legislação esta, este termo de mulher honesta, houve uma profunda alteração no que diz respeito aos crimes sexuais. Depois, em 2015, nós também tivemos uma importante legislação, que trouxe o feminicídio para dentro da nossa legislação como circunstância qualificadora do homicídio e inseriu o feminicídio no rol dos crimes hediondos aqui no Brasil. Ainda nós temos, neste mês recente, em abril, eh, ou início de maio de 2021, uma lei que dispõe sobre o formulário de avaliação de riscos e esta uh, tem aplicação para prevenir o enfrentamento de crimes e atos de violência doméstica e familiar contra a mulher, a respeito do que ainda trataremos. Feita, então, esta contextualização breve, eu gostaria de tratar da temática relativa à perspectiva de gênero eh, no Brasil sobre três principais enfoques o da capacitação e aperfeiçoamento dos magistrados pelas escolas judiciais, em especial pela Escola Nacional de Formação e Aperfeiçoamento de Magistrados, a Infam, no atendimento qualificado a ser disponibilizado à vítima pelos órgãos do sistema de justiça, e ainda, e o que mais nos importa, da perspectiva de gênero como metodologia de julgamento. Aqui, Tratando deste primeiro eixo, eu observo que a capacitação dos magistrados pelas escolas judiciais é muito importante e é um tema que me é muito caro, porque como diretora que fui da Enfam, pude perceber, incentivar e verificar até hoje 
vários cursos que foram feitos nas mais variadas áreas, mas, em especial, no que nos diz respeito aqui, a violência doméstica como uma questão de gênero. É, e nós temos aqui é, cursos realizados voltados para esta temática com o propósito de capacitar e aprimorar os magistrados brasileiros em temas de é, violência de gênero. E nesse curso específico sobre violência doméstica, é, ele se destina a criar condições para que os magistrados desenvolvam uma atitude crítica, reflexiva, baseada na ética e no humanismo, reconhecendo as causas e consequências da violência de gênero e a violação dos direitos humanos das mulheres, percebendo-se como agente político e social, de modo a compreender a necessidade de agir com proatividade, no sentido de adotar estratégias preventivas e contribuir para a interrupção do ciclo da violência. Na atualidade, este propósito das escolas, e especialmente da Enfam, acabou sendo consolidado na recente alteração da Recomendação 79 de 2020 do Conselho Nacional de Justiça, do qual eu pertenço hoje sendo a Corregedora Nacional de Justiça, trazendo à luz parâmetros internacionais, deixando clara a relevância da capacitação de magistrados em direitos fundamentais desde uma perspectiva de gênero. É, pois bem, dentro deste segundo enfoque de perspectiva de gênero, é, trazemos aqui a indispensabilidade da assistência qualificada à vítima pelos órgãos do sistema de justiça. E nesse particular, eu, tro, eu trago desde logo a questão relativa a impacto disruptivo decorrente da pandemia do coronavírus, que impôs aos membros do Poder Judiciário e aos jurisdicionados uma realidade sem precedentes e que impactou, como não poderia deixar de ser, a seara concernente à violência doméstica e violência de gênero. Já sabemos nós, não bastasse este ambiente de vulnerabilidade, de mulheres e meninas inseridas dentro de um contexto de cumprimento de medidas restritivas da mobilidade e que, na maior parte das vezes, confinadas juntamente com os seus agressores, viram-se impossibilitadas de denunciar, diante do limitado acesso em tais circunstâncias, a violência doméstica a quaisquer redes de apoio ao serviço de saúde e até mesmo à justiça. Então, isso nos fez, no Conselho Nacional de Justiça, formar um grupo de trabalho que desenvolveu a campanha Sinal Vermelho contra a Violência Doméstica e voltada, obviamente, a estas pessoas que vivem a violência doméstica e familiar durante o período do isolamento. O que vislumbrou esta campanha como uma ferramenta alternativa para ajudar as vítimas indo à farmácia, eh, drogarias, com um sinal X vermelho na mão, feito com batom vermelho ou até mesmo com uma caneta eh, na palma da mão ou num pedaço de papel, de modo a dar início a um fluxo de atendimento sigiloso e discreto que culmina com o acionamento da polícia militar. Esta campanha fez muito sucesso na sociedade brasileira, como esta ferramenta alternativa de denúncia silenciosa pela vítima de violência de gênero e que agora, inclusive, é objeto de lei em sete estados brasileiros, dentre eles o Distrito Federal. Uma outra inovação para o combate à violência foi a instituição do Formulário Nacional de Avaliação de Riscos de, do início de maio deste ano, e que se destina à prevenção e enfrentamento de crimes e demais atos de violência doméstica e familiar praticados contra a mulher. 
E este formulário nacional de avaliação de riscos foi inspirado na legislação de outros países, a exemplo de Portugal, Austrália, Canadá, Reino Unido e Estados Unidos. E contém 27 perguntas que visam mapear a situação da vítima, do agressor e o histórico de violência que permeia esta relação. Em conformidade com o que estabelece a lei, este questionário deve ser aplicado à mulher vítima de violência na primeira oportunidade em que for atendida, seja pela Polícia Civil, seja pelo Ministério Público ou pelo próprio Poder Judiciário. Outra medida é o Banco Nacional de Medidas de Proteção de Urgência, que foi instituído pelo Conselho Nacional de Justiça e que também é uma importante ferramenta para a contenção da escalada de gênero, da violência de gênero no Brasil. Este banco de dados ele é responsável pela centralização das informações relativas às medidas protetivas e constitui uma plataforma de dados que é mantida e regulada pelo CNJ e alimentada pelos tribunais através da extração de dados de informação de data jude, como nós chamamos, que é uma base de dados unificada do Poder Judiciário. Ela poderá ser acessada pelo Ministério Público, pela Defensoria e pelos organismos de segurança pública e assistência, judicia, assistência social, com o objetivo de melhorar a fiscalização e dar efetividade às medidas de proteção. Por fim, o programa Justiça para a Paz em Casa, que foi promovido a partir de março de 2015, também pelo CNJ, quando o presidente, a ministra Carmen Lúcia, foi feita em parceria com os tribunais de justiça estaduais e tem como objetivo ampliar a efetividade da Lei Maria da Penha por meio de promoção de ações interdisciplinares organizadas e que objetivam dar visibilidade ao tema e sensibilizar a sociedade para a realidade violenta com que as mulheres brasileiras são vistas e tratadas e que enfrentam. E concentrando esforços visando agilizar o andamento de processos relacionados à violência de gênero. Estas ações visam dispensar a vítima um atendimento pelos órgãos do sistema de justiça capaz de assegurar-lhe proteção e contribuir para a interrupção da escalada de violência. O terceiro e último eixo é o da perspectiva de gênero como metodologia de julgamento. E aqui eu trago rapidamente, apenas para contextualizar, um fluxograma para demonstrar que o Conselho Nacional de Justiça, que foi criado por uma emenda constitucional 45 de 2004, instalado em 2005, é um órgão do Poder Judiciário do Brasil com atuação em todo o território nacional. Ele tem como missão é, promover o desenvolvimento do Poder Judiciário em benefício da sociedade, por meio de políticas judiciárias e do controle da atuação administrativa e financeira. Então, no contexto de medidas adotadas pelo CNJ, com o propósito de democratização da participação feminina no poder judiciário e do combate à violência de gênero, foi instituído um grupo de trabalho pela portaria 259 de 2020, incumbido de múltiplas atividades, dentre as quais o desenvolvimento de ações que ampliem e garantam o acesso de mulheres e meninas em situação de alta vulnerabilidade, como indígenas, negras, com deficiência, refugiadas, imigrantes, mulheres de campo e LGBTQI+, vítimas de violência, ao sistema de justiça e à rede de atendimento. São ainda dignas de destaque as recentes alterações promovidas na resolução do CNJ 71 de 2009, 
e na recomendação 79, relativas à aplicação da Lei Maria da Penha no âmbito do Poder Judiciário. O aperfeiçoamento destes atos normativos trouxe à luz parâmetros internacionais de direitos humanos e de capacitação para membros do Poder Judiciário no contexto do adequado enfrentamento à violência de gênero. Também por meio de, da portaria 27 de fevereiro de 2021, foi instituído um grupo de trabalho, desta feita destinado a colaborar com a implementação das políticas nacionais estabelecidas pelas resoluções do CNJ 254 e 255 de 2020, relativas, respectivamente, ao enfrentamento à violência contra mulheres no Poder Judiciário e ao incentivo da participação feminina no Poder Judiciário. E, é, como vocês podem ver, é, este grupo de trabalho finalizará suas atividades com a apresentação de estudos e uma proposta para o estabelecimento de um protocolo para julgar com perspectiva de gênero no âmbito do Poder Judiciário no prazo de 90 dias. É, conquanto este protocolo oficial de, ainda esteja em andamento, essas atividades do grupo do qual eu participo, as atividades estão em andamento, vão culminar com a apresentação de estudos e propostas para o estabelecimento de um protocolo de julgamento com perspectiva de gênero no âmbito do Poder Judiciário. Esses estudos estão sendo feitos a partir, principalmente, da experiência do México, que acredito veremos em seguida, levando em consideração também é, legislações é, de, Portugal, de Uruguai, Chile, outros países da América Latina. Mas, enquanto isto não acontece, eu trago aqui, exemplificadamente, é, duas situações. O Supremo Tribunal Federal concedeu habeas corpus coletivo para inserir em regime de prisão domiciliar todas as mulheres presas ou inseridas no sistema educativo, socioeducativo, que estejam gestantes, ou sejam mães de crianças com até 12 anos de idade, ou que tenham sob sua custódia pessoas com deficiência, com exceção daquelas mães que tenham cometido crimes mediante violência ou grave ameaça contra os seus próprios filhos, ou ainda em situações excepcionalíssimas que o juiz deverá fundamentar. Também trago uma decisão recentíssima, proferida no dia 30 de abril, de 2021, na Justiça do Trabalho, que se considerou que a exigência de que uma lactante que havia acabado de retornar da licença à maternidade, que ela assumisse um posto de trabalho diverso da sua contratação e distante 40 quilômetros do seu posto original, e se entendeu como sendo discriminatório ao trabalho da mulher, por valorar de forma negativa uma condição que lhe é específica de gestante e lactante, exigindo da trabalhadora adaptação a espaço estabelecido a partir de um modelo masculino. Nós contamos ainda com um manual que já foi lançado pela AJUF, que é a Associação das Juízas Federais, fruto de reflexões da Comissão AJUF Mulheres, deste manual sobre julgamento com perspectiva de gênero, que foi lançado em dezembro de 2020, que é composto de uma parte geral e uma parte especial voltada ao direito previdenciário. Este documento, que é, ele parte da constatação de que o acesso à justiça para algumas pessoas enfrenta obstáculos ligados a estereótipos de gênero e raça, além de outros marcadores sociais, e demonstra que a matéria relativa a julgamento com perspectiva de gênero se aplica para além dos casos de violência doméstica, vindo a atingir outras esferas jurídicas, a exemplo do Poder Judiciário. Outra cartilha, lançada em abril de 2016, 
estabelecendo diretrizes para o julgamento do feminicídio, é uma adaptação do modelo de protocolo latino-americano para investigação das mortes violentas e mulheres, de mulheres por razão de gênero, a realidade social, cultural, policia, eh, política e jurídica no Brasil. Este documento constitui uma iniciativa do Escritório da ONU Mulheres no Brasil, em parceria com a Secretaria de Políticas para Mulheres da Presidência da República e com o apoio do governo da Áustria. É, não é demais lembrar, todos nós sabemos que a América Latina tem despontado no ranking dos locais do globo mais violentos, notadamente no que concerne aos índices de feminicídio e violência doméstica, e as experiências de outros países, a exemplo do Chile, México e Uruguai, ao tratarem do tema, são premissas fundamentais para o desenvolvimento de balizas eh, a respeito do julgamento com perspectiva de gênero no Brasil. Eu não quero me alongar mais nesta minha breve exposição, até mesmo para possibilitar os debates, já que muito pode ser dito pelas demais componentes desta mesa. Eu gostaria apenas de é, enfatizar que é, nós temos no Brasil muito interesse mesmo em poder estabelecer um protocolo de julgamento com que para questões de gênero, estamos trabalhando nisso, nos valemos das experiências havidas na América Latina e acredito que o Conselho Nacional de Justiça, do qual eu faço parte, é, está muito empenhado em estabelecer políticas é, voltadas à proteção é, da questão de gênero, da mulher em violência doméstica, e não só a mulher, mas todas aquelas pessoas vulneráveis e que estão submetidas ao sistema de justiça por aqui. É, eu agradeço, eu restituo a palavra ao Pablo e agradeço mais uma vez ao Leonel a oportunidade de estar aqui neste importante evento para a compreensão desta matéria que é extremamente relevante. Muitas graças a todos. Muchas gracias, María Teresa, por su presentación. Thank you, María Teresa, for your presentation. We'll continue with Marcela Siles, who is an attorney from the Public Defense Office in Bolivia. Unfortunately, Marcela is muted. Apologies, I hadn't turned on the audio. I was saying that it's a pleasure for me to share this round table with all of you. I thank Jaime Mariano and Leonel Gonzalez of the JCA for the invitation and congratulate them for the work they're presenting today on justice and the social context. To begin, talking about the experience of a plurinational public defense service and the approach and defense of criminal cases with a gender perspective, which is what I've been asked to prepare, I would first refer to the regulatory context in which our service operates. The plurinational public defense service of Bolivia was created by law 463 on December 19th, 2013, as a decentralized directorate of the Ministry of Justice and Institutional Transparency in charge of public criminal defense regime uh, for persons reported charged or criminally prosecuted who do not have the economic resources or do not are not able to appoint a lawyer for their defense. In this service, we do not have any law that specifically obliges defender to approach defensive cases with a gender perspective, as is the case of neighboring countries. However, our political constitution of the state contains the doctrine of block constitutionality in Article 410, stating that it is composed of international treaties on human rights, international human rights law, 
and norms of community law ratified by each country. It must be specified that it's not only about conventional norms, which are part of this block of constitutionality, but also non-conventional norms, such as declarations, principles, and rules. This has been stressed by the Constitutional Court in SC 0061-2010. In addition, given the normative nature of the Constitution, it has direct application, and it is a great advantage, as it is not necessary to have a prior legislative development for its implementation. This characteristic is reflected in Article 109 of the political constitution of the state, which establishes as a jurisdictional guarantee the direct application of the rights recognized in the political constitution of the state, indicating that all rights recognized in the constitution are directly applicable and enjoy equal guarantees for their protection. On the other hand, this is very interesting. It has actual specific and real applications that I will be mentioning. On the other hand, the Constitutional Court has established, and I'll continue to refer to norms and criteria, that the Public Defense uh, Service works on, has drawn certain lines on cases where some more interesting ones were chosen to mention. One is the obligation that judges and courts have to apply a gender perspective in the framework of the obligations undertaken by the Bolivian state. This is, uh, these are the constitutional sentences that were uh, ruled, 64 and, nine of, and 19 of 2018 and 17 of 2019. One, it's very interesting. It's about the requirements for men who uh, need to show their vulnerability as a result of gender roles and stereotypes that would put them at a disadvantage and subordination in their environment. And again, this um, case is 346 of 2018 as two. And as you may have noticed, this is the result of a complaint of a man for domestic violence. In the area of precautionary measures, it is at that procedural moment when we must use this advantage for users within the context of precautionary measures. The reinforced protection of pregnant women and the recognition of work in the home as a lawful activity, demanding as a single requirement for evidence, the woman's identity. In Bolivia, uh, domestic work is called being a housewife, which for whatever cultural or socioeconomic circumstances, the situation that a large part of the population of women in Bolivia find themselves in. In the case of rulings, it was necessary to prove this. So this, it's important to mention that this the Supreme Court approved the protocol for judging with a gender perspective addressed to judges of the country. It has socioeconomic importance and is therefore very important. It has given way to many constitutional sentences. And I would like to reiterate the ID card, which is a document that is used for women who work in the household. It has been used to restrict um, women who are in prison or even once they have a conviction and makes it difficult for them to continue 
uh, serving their sentence from home. And in this ordinary justice system, it is contemplated that preventive detention be admissible, inadmissible in the case of pregnant women and nursing mothers of children under one year of age, except in serious crimes. This aspect also restricts our work, and I will explain why. Finally, it's worth mentioning that by agreement of the full court, 126 in 2016, the Supreme Court of Justice approved the protocol for judging with a gender perspective, which was addressed to judges of the country. Likewise, the Attorney General's office has already stressed the guidelines for procedural action with a gender perspective for the public prosecutor's office. But it's important to note that both are focused on the prosecution of cases where women are victims of violence. I've been asked to analyze how the defense operates. But there's other norms. So along with these protocols, in Bolivia, the judiciary carries uh, other actions tending to guarantee that judges may include gender perspective. And they organize, every year they organize a national contest on sentences with gender perspective, which are very interesting and make the work of our judges visible, especially those who must uh, judge with a gender perspective. And it's different from other justice operators, but it is an example and a way to introduce the topic. Now let me refer to specific aspects. Regarding the activity developed by the Plurinational De Public Defense Service, it should be noted that according to the last report, less than 20% of our users are women, mostly prosecuted. Well, actually, it's 19.34%, which I believe uh, is a specific number, which are mostly prosecuted for crimes against physical integrity, economic crimes, and drug trafficking. So it would be interesting, perhaps, to conduct a study or some type of detailed examination on why the preeminence of the crimes that people we defend are being charged for tend to be physical abuse against women. Back in 2003, a law was enacted to ensure that women may live a life free of violence. This same law actually refers to a variety of different crimes, for example, feminicide, femicide rather, and the other related crimes that we're familiar with. Also, this law refers to other crimes involving violence against women. Now, I was also asked to speak about specific cases, and that is why I have delved into some details with regard to the circumstances of the female uh, legal system users. and others who are actually detained for uh, physical violence against women. We know why they're detained. They're, we also know that they live in a context where most where issues may actually tend to be resolved with violence. And unfortunately, uh, I don't think there are any countries near us where violence has been addressed from an educational family-centered perspective. We all know that violence engenders violence Anyhow, in short, this large number of uh, those accused for violence against women include, for example, uh, 
abuse against women, daughters, mothers-in-laws, a very long, large list. Why do I say long? Well, because nationally speaking, I have 300 odd cases and I have 1,900 cases only with regard to women in service. Now, with regard to that same aspect, the victims of violent acts are often among also vulnerable groups, children, the elderly. And this makes it difficult to actually approach defense process with differentiated criteria because for the judges and administrators, this creates a conflict, right? Conflict of interests and this is something that needs to be resolved. Now, we do not have specialized defenders for gender issues, defense attorneys. There are specialized judges, though. The law I mentioned with regard to violence against women actually created the figure, the role of specialized judges, judges in violence against women. The same law has also resulted in special investigative groups for gender violence. But as far as the public defender's office, they do not have special experts, special attorneys in this field. Despite that, specialized material has been made available and the gender approach has been included in the training sessions that we hold, such as the most recent one held in March and actually organized by FEDIG. And this was specifically a program that addressed access to justice for women from a gender and human rights perspective in jurisprudence. Now, even though our system does not foresee situations in which criminal conduct has gender violence as its origin. Currently, and in specific cases, public defenders request psychosocial evaluations with the intent of exempting or mitigating criminal liability. As I mentioned earlier, who, let me refer to our users. Now, what are the issues that they deal with? Well, violence, injuries, and drug trafficking. Also, our legal system has several restrictions with regard to crimes related to violence against women and drug trafficking. Generally speaking, as a result of that, if we use this psychological approach, uh, this approach is used for example, there, we have 66 open cases against with regard to uh, murder of women. Anyhow, these reports, so psychological reports are also submitted with other documents uh, during uh, precautionary measures, precautionary measure hearings, hearings in order to uh, request uh, preventive imprisonment and to secure the financial socioeconomic conditions of the victims. This is important, as we mentioned earlier, the whole goal of the public defender's office is to defend those who have limited resources. Therefore, it's important to mention that these, it's important to mention the, the importance of these psychological reports are key. Now with regard to the prosecutor's office, recent publications has made the precautionary measures more visible and more available to the public. And this has helped out women with young children or pregnant um, breastfeeding women. And there are several other aspects related to the family. They have been recognized as domestic work, as a lawful activity, and other related other activities related to the family. Moreover, the work of the deep, of the public defender's office is also aimed at 
demanding that justice agents meet, uh, comply with the law, constitutional jurisprudence, international treaties and conventions that are more explicit. As explained above, these are directly applied. And in some cases, actually, uh, we raise defense actions. Now, I have provided several examples, and as a result of that, it's quite clear that the way in which criminal defense of our customers is actually approached is insufficient in terms of ensuring equal access to justice. And this is due to several different limitations that the institutions face. Now, despite that, a series of measures are being taken to improve the services provided, while at the same time, gradual change is actually taking place with regard to the approach of public defenders, with regard to the importance of including gender the gender perspective in their defense so that they actually are aware of uh, situations of vulnerability or discrimination that's based on sex, gender, or sexual orientation, and that they take appropriate measures to ensure that justice operators or agents actually apply principles of equality and reasonableness in their rulings. Very well, then, if you don't have any questions or need any uh, clarification, I will complete my presentation here. Thank you once again for inviting me. Thank you, Marcela, for your remarks. Let us move on with Marisol Castañeda. She is an attorney and a justice, federal justice, second circuit court in Querétaro, Querétaro, Mexico. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to take part in this seminar, Justice and Social Tech Context, sponsored by JSCA. Let me tell you this. Since 2013, the Supreme Court of the nation actually issued a protocol to include gender perspective. And I will refer to the current version of said protocol, which was actually published in November of last year. One moment, please. I will share my screen. As I mentioned, gender perspective as a, an analytical tool was introduced in the judicial realm after recognizing the actual inequality, gender inequality that has an impact on women and girls because it creates a situation in which the their rights cannot be fully exercised, whether either explicitly or through institutional practices. And uh, they are inevitably subject to an, an state of insubordination. Now the Constitutional Court introduced gender perspective as a way to ensure that people, particularly women and girls, have access to justice effectively and equally. Now they started with this concept that gender must be taken into consideration when the evidence is shown assessed and when the legal rules are applied. Now there's an obligation to judge with gender perspective, but this is not specifically stated under any specific law under the constitution, by the way, but rather this is an obligation that has uh, resulted from the interpretation given by the Supreme Court with regard to human rights, rights as recognized under the Constitution. We actually had a human rights reform that in June uh, has will be celebrating its 10th anniversary. And based on the interpretation, contradicting Theses 200 from 2011, the conclusion has been drawn that the Mexican state and then in Mexico, all rights are equal. They're one single block, and you cannot dis differentiate between those that are enshrined under the uh, Constitution or others or uh, others that are enshrined elsewhere. So the court actually 
stated that is critical for all controversy in which there may actually be potential disadvantages resulting from cultural stereotypes or that are the result of uh, reported examples of gender violence, regardless of its type, the state authorities must implement a protocol to ensure that the individual's rights are exercised. So therefore it was determined that gender perspective constitutes a method that must be applied in all cases, even when the parties involved do not expressly request this in their arguments. In other words, as judicial operators, we are obliged, it is mandatory for us to, when we detect these situations of disparity, to apply gender perspective, regardless of whether or not we have been requested to do so. That is the situation. So what does it mean to say judging with gender perspective in Mexico? Well, first of all, it involves analyzing the rules, the facts, and the uh, evidence with gender perspective. Now, the high court of the nation has stated that gender perspective must be used first to interpret the rules and apply the law, and secondly, to assess the facts and the evidence that are part of the case. And so the first uh, level determined that gender perspective makes it mandatory for us to read and interpret the regulations, bearing in mind the ideological principles that, uh, it, that uphold it. When you therefore interpret the regulations applied to a specific case, those individuals in the justice legal system are, have the obligation to assess whether or not there has been a direct violation of the right to equality by uh, introducing differentiated impacts based on gender. And if so, then it's an obligation of the judge to prefer the interpretive option that does away with this discrimination. And in that case, opt for not applying the actual rule. The court has also considered that gender perspective is not just applicable in terms of interpreting uh, regulatory uh, provisions, but it should also be used to address gender issues and circumstances that have an impact on how the facts are interpreted. In one of the rulings 1396211, the court also introduced another key system, which is determining reparations for victims as a key component of this uh, obligation to judge with gender perspective. When will it be mandatory to judge with a gender perspective? Well, there are several different areas, and this is something I will talk about now. For example, uh, there are several when it is, we know that this can be addressed from a dual perspective. One, you can address this from the individual's side and from the case side. With regard to the individuals, the Supreme Court has said that gender perspective is not just applicable to women. That has been made very clear by our courts, Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has said that although it is true that women are often the, uh, the victims of negative aspects of gender, but the in the end, the gender approach aims to determine how law affects the specific situations of people all, all abroad, all across the board. So very specific times when the court has actually stated that there are specific rules that have an impact on men. For example, there's a social security law that states that mothers have the right to uh, have a babysitting service or for their younger children just because they're women, but certain conditions are placed on men, on fathers. They have to be uh, single men 
uh, unmarried, they have to have custody of the minors. And in the event that they are no, that if they were to get married, then in that case, they will no longer have the right to this type of care. So the court, the court studies it from different perspectives and they try to see how the children are treated, children with the mother or children with the father. On the side of men, the norm is discriminatory because it is conditioning the right of this service just because they are men. I'd like to share then that in Mexico, this idea of gender perspective has been very specifically addressed by the court. It is not only about women, it is substantially about equality. So when judging with gender perspective, the courts have distinguished in three basic principles. One where you have a power situation or a symmetry based on gender. Two, those cases where uh, there is a report of context of violence, discrimination, or vulnerability deriving from this category. And when there is a possibility of a differentiated treatment or impact based on gender, which is many times expressed by means of stereotypes or gender roles implicit in norms and institutional and social practices. The impact of the decisions of the Supreme Court of Justice of the Nation and the Mexican legal system permeate all judges as uh, holders of their processes becoming compulsory in the cases uh, of by jurisprudence. And in May, a new system was created for uh, compulsory uh, nature, and the resolutions issued by the Supreme Court of Justice are compulsory for all legal operators of the country. And in order to do this with gender perspective and to be fair, the criteria issued by the Supreme Court of Justice analyze the different impacts of the standards of the stereotypes, gender roles within the family or workplace dynamics, substantive or other asymmetries. And also jurisprudence on the methodology and we have jurisprudence which is our ABCs for all legal operators. We have jurisprudence 22 of 2016, issued by the Supreme Court of Justice, where it states specifically what steps should be taken in this task in order to judge with uh, a rule with gender perspective. And it's important to identify situations of power where there are is a balance or imbalance between the parties. Second, to question these facts and to value the evidence is showing any prejudice in order to make visible all these disadvantages caused by sex gender. And if the evidence not enough to clarify this violence, vulnerability, or discrimination uh, by gender, we are obliged to require the necessary evidence to clarify the situation should there be any disadvantage due to gender. We would assess the differentiated impact of the proposed solution to find a fair and equal resolution and we apply the standards of human rights of all people and especially boys and girls finally considering that the method demands that at all times the language based on stereotypes and prejudice be avoided and that it must be thought to use inclusive language these are the abcs for all judges in Mexico, we all need to know these when judging uh, with gender perspective. 
So the interpretation made by the court at some of these instances have served us to carry out our own task with the courts. And I'd like to mention and share three cases that are of the most important cases that the court have ruled, courts have ruled on. One was concubine figure. In Mexico, there is such figure and it says that it will not exist as such if any of the persons involved is married with a third person. And this is how I will quickly say that a woman acquired a pension from the man who she lived with for 12 years, despite the fact that he was already married. And of course, the judge denied access to this right because he based himself on Article 67 of the Family Code that it was not legitimate given that the man is married. Therefore, the woman carried forth another trial, argumenting that the legal provision being applied countervenes the rights to equality and non-discrimination. So this reached the Supreme Court of Justice, where it was analyzed whether the requirement of the legislator had any legal um, grounds, especially in the case of single people. And it was declared inconstitutional because it was estimated that it was discriminatory to women and that this cohabitation issue should be resolved with gender perspective. So it was applied to the case and it was deemed um, historic reality that had been overcome. There was no constitutional uh, rule that would deny cohabitation only to single people. And although this form intended to take care of families, there were no families of first or second class and they should all be taken into account equally, whether um, to do cohabitation or within marriage. Another case is the value of the uh, report by a victim of rape. So this is very important. It's actually the result of a crime, a rape crime that was traded against a former partner and they were no longer together when this happened, but they had been. And these facts are basically that there is a um, encounter where she says that she was very much afraid of him because during the time that they had a sentimental relationship, he was very violent and he constantly threatened to hurt her and her family. She finally met with him and he forced her to have sexual relations. And it was a situation that she narrated was completely distorted because of this psychological violence that he had exerted on her for so long during their relationship. So the assailant was released, but Finally, it was requested to review the case again, argumenting that a misinterpretation as it was not judged with gender perspective. So gender perspective was being used only to re-victimize her or women. And the single fact that he was being deemed chauvinistic and aggressive was not enough by his partner, was not enough because there was no further proof evidence. And at the first room of the Supreme Court, 
they finally ruled based on gender perspective and decided that this not only precludes, but also requested that there be a value assigned to the statement of the victim of sexual assault. The statement alone was deemed to be insufficient earlier and that it was being incorrectly applied, the gender perspective. And finally, this last case, very interesting, this is about a mother was accused and convicted uh, fiance for uh, kidnapping children. She is the mother of a child who did not live with her. The child lived with his father. He decided to go to the school because several people had told her that the boy was um, in a bad state, un, un, not well fed. And she took the child to her home and she was accused of kidnapping. And the judge ruled against her. And then there was a, an appeal where the woman requested that the child be not be taken back to her father. This went to the Supreme Court of Justice and it was indicated that the obligation of judges in ruling with gender perspective could affect their ability to rule fairly because historically there has been such a situation women have found themselves in and around the role that they should perform. So this was a specific situation and they, it was ruled that the child should participate in the trial. So they should also be given the possibility to offer their opinion to the judge, depending on their uh, age and ability to express themselves. This finally did reach the Supreme Court by means of a review against the ruling. And I'd like to stress this because in Mexican courts, it is very difficult to take these uh, rulings uh, to, to the Supreme Court and be, because of the recent laws approved or enacted in Congress there are still competencies on many uh, aspects of legality and courts should, the Supreme Court should become a constitutional court is what is believed. And so it did reach the Supreme Court of Justice because they discussed the omission of the gender perspective that it had not been included. So I believe what they did was very important. They sustained that the omission of judging with a gender perspective is a constitutional matter. And that is what opened the door for this to go to the Supreme Court of Justice. Finally, today we have jurisprudence. It is uh, compulsory for all judges in the country. And based on that, we are obliged to carry out this gender perspective study. But as I said in the beginning, to get here, it was not uh, the case. Let me also share something with you. And that is that we have all these international treaties that the state of Mexico is a party to. Uh, that specifically refer to uh, women's and uh, minors and, and uh, girls' rights. Those apply as well. Thank you. Thank you, Marisol, for your presentation. And thank you to the three speakers. We have a few questions for all of you. The first is from Cecilia. In my country, we do have female judges, but the higher the judgeship, 
the less presence of women. Do you think it would be appropriate to have a law to, ins to ensure a quota for female participants? Well, in Mexico, actually, we are reforming the constitution. Well, there's a 2019 reform of the Constitution, which defines the man, the mandatory nature of parity, gender parity for all posts. Now we have to actually recognize that, unfortunately, that has not been met across the board. What was or has been possible thus far is uh, within the legislature, we have 50%, 50-50, but right now we are about to have elections in just a few days. And as a result, it was necessary for the electoral committee to state, to, man to make it mandatory for the parties to actually come up with 50-50 uh, gender parity candidates. Now, generally speaking, there is a gender parity cabinet. And with regard to the judiciary, there is an issue, but let me let you know that at the federal level, the judiciary has implemented a gender parity policy based on the fact that Minister Arturo Saldiva, the actual chair president of the Supreme Court has absolutely an agreement with this parity issue. He has absolutely stated that in order to access posts of judgeship and magistrates, the first post will be exclusively available for women. And in 2021, there are several processes underway to elect judges and magistrates, and it has been made mandatory that there is parity in these processes. That means that if you have 100 judgeships or magistrateships, 50 will be for women and 50 will be for men, regardless. So at the federal judiciary level, we are working on this and we are specifically addressing this aspect. But there's another issue, which is local judgeships. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Teresa and Marcela, would you care to comment on that? Apenas para dizer que no Brasil, em relação à magistratura, não há uma lei que estabeleça cotas, mas a participação das mulheres na magistratura tem aumentado. Em 2008, por exemplo, eram mulheres quase 25% e homens 75%, um pouquinho menos para as mulheres. Em 2018, as mulheres já são 38,8%, ou seja, quase 40%. E embora hoje em dia as mulheres sejam na população brasileira é, em número superior a dos homens, as mulheres já são 51,6%, é, ainda temos um número inferior de mulheres proporcionalmente ao de homens, mas o número está crescendo, e na, assim como também no México, aqui no, no, em matéria eleitoral, já temos sim é, um percentual de cotas para mulheres, e inclusive a Ordem dos Advogados do Brasil também já estabelece algo para, para que compõe a diretoria um número igual mulheres, homens. Estamos crescendo, mas não temos ainda uma lei para isso. Obrigada. Muito obrigada. Marcela? Thank you for that, Marcela. Well, in Bolivia, we have the department level governments in the legislature. There is a law, gender parity and gender... All taking turns, <laughs> that's, I guess, one way of saying it. It's not always upheld, though. At the judiciary level in Bolivia, the high positions of magistrate are broken down by divisions. And at the municipal level, there should, I mean, according to law, there should be parity in this regard. As far as the number of female and male judges and magistrates, it's not equal. 
yet, but it is improving, of course, depending on the uh, matter at hand being judged. Thank you. We have another question for all three of you. You have conducted studies. Do you see that there is also gender violence against men? I talked a bit about this and I said yes in Mexico uh, based on the criteria issued by the Supreme Court. This issue is just is about equality. It's it's not about your gender is not specifically focused on women but rather this is a an issue that boosts, that seeks equality for all and so when uh, there are cases in which men's rights are being trampled they are protected as uh, well as or equally as women are Maria Teresa for vítima de violência ele assim terá o seu pedido atendido em termos de gênero, mas o que se verifica é esta preocupação com as pessoas mais vulneráveis, e aqui não somente mulher, mas tratando-se de gênero, né? numa visão muito mais ampla é, de pessoas que abrangem muito mais do que apenas mulheres. Marcela? Marcela? Violence against men in Bolivia does exist, but obviously it's not something that is um, seen. Now, I did refer to the constitutional court ruling that requires men to stand out against violence and they have to actually meet certain criteria. They need to show that they are vulnerable and that their uh, vulnerability is the result of uh, violence or uh, stereotypes or situations that place them at a disadvantage somehow. Open processes are not so common. There aren't many of those, but there is a city in Bolivia where there is an association of male violence, male victims of violence. Just let me mention something finally, that the court has actually issued a ruling on something very important, which is the care of children and all of the civil codes for all of the Mexican states. There's at least one provision that states that in the event of separation, minors, uh, depends on the, on the age, is not a unanimous age, they must always be placed in the mother's care. And the Supreme Court actually analyzed this issue and ruled that this is a entirely discriminatory regulation because just because men are men, it is assumed that they are not capable of taking care of or raising a minor. So it, of course you need to bear in mind the context and do what is specifically best for the interests of the child. And so we also have a protocol in Mexico uh, with regard to uh, rulings related to minors. Thank you. Thank you, Marisol, for that. Thank you, Maria Teresa, as well. And Marisol, Maricela, as well. Thank you for that. Let me give the floor to Jaime Arellano, who will be closing this seminar. I will just be very quick. I don't want to bore you. This has been in a fabulous round table. You actually have seen what occurs in Canada. Canada is our uh, sponsor in this uh, activity and project. The Canadian government has an uh, international feminist policy, which is expressed through Global Affairs Canada, which is their international development uh, arm, if you will, for foreign trade and uh, foreign affairs. As I mentioned early on, there you can uh, have this uh, multiplier effect 
throughout the region, when you have a single feminist movement, when you open a debate on gender violence uh, and the need to include the gender perspective. And as I mentioned earlier, we were forced at JSCA to Look at our look ourselves in the mirror and to understand that we will not be able to have an impact on the justice systems unless we uh, define strategic objectives. For example, influence the justice system so that gender equality and the gender perspective were to be included in the institu institutional arrangements and obviously in the daily actions uh, activities carried out in the legal system. So that's what we're actually working on. I'm sure you have seen this. You've the, if you take a peek at the, uh, the image on this screen, part of our policy has been to not just have panels made up of men. Uh, we did that in the past without even realizing it, but we no longer have seminars with the only male participants. And we do not accept invitations to take part in panels that do not have that that have that are are uh, made up of a single gender so the canadians have actually uh, allowed the jsca to change what well, we are actually still changing and there's been a great deal of resistance in latin america primarily by us by men and uh, by the more conservative pockets, but we have all brought about significant change. And I think this change is aimed at having social justice based on the social context. As Maria Teresa and Marisol and Marcela just mentioned, this change, the social context, involves being fully aware of all the various groups that wh whose rights are are essentially uh, violated by our justice systems women have been the poster child if you will of all of this but there are other minority groups indigenous groups or native uh, communities different racial groups, religious, philosophical groups have also been affected by this. And so we are all working on creating more protective integrated communities and as a result on having a legal justice system that really makes the effort. And so Canada has been a pioneer in this regard. Justice Kent has referred to their progress in this realm. And at JSCA, we hope to do the same and we hope to actually provide you with more interesting uh, news. We're not here to copy what has been done. We are here to take these great ideas and Latinize them and tropicalize them as some say, and uh, make them our own, put our own spin on them and then share them with you. So I think we have met that objective. JSCA does not reinvent the wheel. Rather, we are always sharing and exchanging ideas that with a Brazilian or Bolivian or Mexican or Chilean, Argentinian accent with the, the a Canadian English accent from Calgary or uh, with the uh, Ontario accent of our board member, uh, Benjamin Berger. So thank you so much to all of you who have been following us and listening carefully all afternoon. Thank you once again to the JSCA team for organizing this event. Thank you to Paolo for moderating this event, Leonel as well for heading up this, the organization of this event. And Sandra, whose face is not shown, but she is our IT coordinator of all events. She's always behind this. Jose Soria as well, who's actually providing us with so technical support from Australia in the wee hours of the morning. And our interpreters, Claudia and Holly, who have actually made it possible for us to do away with one barrier, which is the language barrier. So thank you so much to all of you for making this a success. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you in the very near future. If this entails a Zoom meeting, then so be it. But hopefully we will see each other soon, uh, live and in person. Thank you very much once again to all of you. Enjoy your afternoon. Gracias. Hasta pronto. Gracias. Hasta luego.